The B-1 Lancer was designed as a fast nuclear breaker of Soviet air defenses, an aircraft from an era where the future was measured in MOX, altitude, and minutes of approach. However, it ultimately became famous not for its nuclear role, but for becoming a workhorse, for which the important things were not megatons, but hours of loitering over the battlefield, accuracy, and the ability to deliver more payload in just one sortie than an entire squadron. The rise of the B-1 is the story of how an aircraft built for one war became the legend of another. But will its capabilities suffice for future conflicts, or will it hand over its responsibilities to another legend, the B-52 Stratofortress? Let's find out right now. The B-1 Lancer's trajectory began at the height of the Cold War, when strategic planning relied on rigid, almost mechanical calculations. How many minutes does it take a bomber to reach its target? At what altitude will it fly? Will it be able to overcome the enemy's layered air defense system, saturated with radar stations, anti-aircraft systems, and interceptors? The answer to these and many other questions was supposed to be a new American bomber that would be faster and more aggressive than the B-52 Stratofortress. With variable sweep wings, prototype speeds exceeding Mach 2, and the ability to fly at extremely low altitudes, the B-1's design spoke volumes about the United States' desire to win the race against time. Lancer had to break through to where the enemy simply wouldn't have time to react. But the world changed faster than the designers expected. The B-1's first major problem was inflation, which caused the price tag for a single aircraft to skyrocket from $40 million in 1970 to $70 million in 1975, and by 1977 had reached $100 million over a 20-year service life, prompting President Carter to reconsider the program. Fuel was also added to Carter's fire of doubts by the U.S. Air Force's active work on its new stealth aircraft, the Advanced Technology Bomber, ATB, which at the time seemed far more promising than yet another bomber. However, the final touch that put an end, albeit temporarily, to the career of the B-1, which had not yet entered production, was the situation with the Soviet defector pilot Viktor Belenko, who defected to Japan in his MiG-25 Foxbat in September 1976. During interrogation, he spoke of the new Soviet Super Foxbat, which was almost certainly a MiG-31 Foxhound, equipped with a radar capable of detecting and shooting down targets from below to attack cruise missiles. This feature of the new Soviet fighter would have made any U.S. aircraft flying at low altitude visible and easy to attack. Thus, the question of survivability and the fact that the B-1's armament at the time was similar to that of the B-52 led many officials and military personnel to increasingly question the Lancer development program. For example, Democratic U.S. Senator Edward William Proxmire regularly derided the B-1, calling it nothing less than an expensive dinosaur. Pentagon officials also took every opportunity to publicly snipe the B-1, claiming that the AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile ALCM, launched from the fleet of existing B-52 Stratofortresses would give the U.S. Air Force equal capabilities for penetrating Soviet airspace. Ultimately, in 1977, Carter announced the cancellation of the B-1A in favor of intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and a fleet of upgraded B-52s with the AGM-86 ALCM. But the B-1 was too good to be forgotten so easily. Therefore, with the arrival of President Reagan, the decision was made to purchase both the B-1 and the advanced strategic stealth bombers of the ATB program. In the winter of 1982, the U.S. Air Force awarded Rockwell two contracts totaling $2.2 billion for the development and production of 100 B-1 bombers, and work began again. Granted, the design of the original B-1 was not without changes, as it had to be adapted to the expected tasks. The result was a modified B-1B, with a reduced maximum speed, which allowed the variable aspect ratio air intakes to be replaced with simpler fixed geometry ones. This significantly reduced the B-1B's radar signature, a welcome trade-off for the reduced speed. The B-1B prioritized high subsonic speeds at low altitudes, increasing the original Mach 0.85 to Mach 0.92, with the converted B-1 achieving a top speed of Mach 1.25. A separate point of importance was the increase in maximum takeoff weight from 395,000 pounds for the B-1A 
to 477,000 pounds for the B-1B. Naturally, no one was thinking about the B-1's confrontation with the Soviet MiG-31's radars and their Zaslan radar system. To address this, the Lancer's electronic warfare suite was heavily upgraded. In 1986, the B-1B officially entered service with the Strategic Air Command SAC, as a nuclear bomber, and by 1988, the U.S. Air Force had received all 100 aircraft. However, with the collapse of the USSR, the Cold War ended and the global nuclear exchange scenario for which the legendary bone was created remained a mere matter of staff documents. In 1992, it was transferred to Air Combat Command and converted to conventional bombing missions completely dismantling its nuclear mission by 1994. The 1990s were generally traumatic for the B-1. The aircraft was quite complex and expensive to maintain and, at the time, had no clear role. But at the same time, warfare itself was changing. Strikes became more targeted and the ability to deliver large quantities of munitions to a specific area and hover over it became more important. The B-1 proved to be ideal for all these roles, even though its original purpose was completely different. The bomber's first test was the operation against Yugoslavia in 1999. During the Allied Force campaign, heavy bombers played a role that would have been difficult to predict even 10 years earlier. While flying only a small fraction of all combat sorties, they provided a significant portion of the total volume of ordnance dropped operating from long distances and minimizing the burden on forward airfields. For the B-1, this moment was a turning point. The aircraft was finally established as a conventional strike aircraft capable of performing missions previously considered the preserve of tactical aviation. Simply put, Kosovo had proven that relying on range and payload can have a strategic impact even in a limited conflict. In Iraq, Lancers evolved from precision strikes to systematic use in a major campaign. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, the bombers acted as mobile arsenals, capable of striking dozens of targets in just one sortie. A distinctive feature of the B-1 was its ability to patrol for long periods and quickly respond to any changes in the situation. With ground forces rapidly advancing, this turned the aircraft into a vital support element reducing the time between target acquisition and engagement. This is where the B-1 earned its reputation as the U.S. Air Force's long-range strike workhorse. During the war in Afghanistan, the mountainous terrain, remoteness of the theater, and limited infrastructure made the role of long-range aviation and the B-1 in particular, particularly in demand. It was increasingly used not as a classic strategic bomber, but as a means of close air support for troops. It circled over the combat zone for hours, which meant almost constant fire support for the soldiers on the ground and the ability for the command to solve problems without transferring large air forces to forward airfields. General John P. Jumper, the Air Force Chief of Staff, gave one example of the new approach to the work of the Air Force bombers. A combat air controller in Afghanistan transmitted enemy coordinates to a B-52 bomber at 39,000 feet which then dropped laser-guided munitions on a target just a thousand feet in front of friendly forces. That's the effect of close air support, Jumper said. You didn't see the airplane or feel the heat from the engines, but the precision was even better than what we were able to do in Vietnam. This experience proved unique in many ways. A strategic bomber designed for a nuclear strike against a continental enemy found itself integrated into the tactical chain of modern warfare working closely with UAVs, reconnaissance, and forward air controllers, thereby completely blurring the line between strategic and tactical aviation. Libya in 2011 further demonstrated the versatility of the Lancer fleet. They carried out long-range sorties delivering precision strikes against enemy air defenses and command posts. The campaign demonstrated that the B-1 is capable of operating autonomously, relying solely on its own range refueling, and firepower. The last major stage of the B-1's combat career was Syria, where the bombers were increasingly used as carriers of long-range precision weapons operating outside the range of enemy air defenses. But at the same time, the limits of the device's capabilities became apparent. Its intensive use in real combat conditions greatly accelerated the wear and tear of the airframe. Maintenance became increasingly expensive and labor-intensive 
and engineering solutions justified during the Cold War era were increasingly unsuited to the requirements of the 21st century. At the turn of the 2010s, the B-1 was sorely lacking reliable digital communications, proper tactical picture sharing, cockpit ergonomics, and quick diagnostics for all systems. To close this gap, in 2012, the U.S. Air Force launched an eight-year modification of the Integrated Battle System IBS, which combined three upgrades at once. Fully Integrated Data Link FIDL, provided electronic data exchange and eliminated the need for manual entry of information between systems. The Vertical Situational Display Unit VSDU, replaced the existing flight instruments with multifunction color displays the second of which helped with threat avoidance and target acquisition and also served as a backup. And the Central Integrated Test System CITS, a new diagnostic system that allowed the B-1 crew to monitor more than 9,000 aircraft parameters. Other updates included the replacement of two spinning mass gyroscopic inertial navigation system with ring laser gyroscopic systems and a GPS antenna, replacing the APQ-164 radar with a scalable agile beam radar, Global Strike Sabre GS, active electronically scanned array, and a new orientation indicator. In the late 2010s, the B-1 acquired Sea Fangs. While the IBS is the aircraft's brains, the long-range anti-ship missiles, El Razum, take on a new role. The delivery of the first production AGM-158C El Razum from Lockheed Martin to operational units of the U.S. Air Force has brought the system to early operational capability on the B-1B. Now it was perceived not only as a land truck, but also as a vehicle for long-range anti-ship strikes. This would be especially valuable in any future high-tech battles with China in the Pacific. In the fall of 2023, Dias Air Force Base unveiled the first modified B-1B as part of the B-1 Embracing Agile Scheduling Team Beast program, marking a new era of combat effectiveness for the venerable aircraft. The point of Beast wasn't so much the specific feature as the method to accelerate the implementation of any set of improvements on the aging fleet while the aircraft is needed in service and before the window to the mass introduction of the B-21 Raider in the 2030s closes. While 2025 became the moment of truth for the installation of a new pylon from Boeing, which greatly expands the range of heavy weapons under the fuselage of the B-1B called Load Adaptable Modular LAM. The company has previously stated that the LAM can be configured to carry up to 7,500 pounds, but it's unclear exactly what limit the Air Force is targeting for Boeing. In fact, this would open the door to the use of the advanced AGM-183 air-launched rapid response weapon, Aero, hypersonic air-to-ground ballistic missile, as well as a whole class of 5,000-plus pound munitions. Comparing the B-1B Lancer with another legendary bomber, the B-52 Stratofortress, one cannot help but realize that while the former is being upgraded to the point of being replaced by the B-21 Raider, the latter's in no hurry. On the contrary, it's being modernized so regularly and extensively as if it still has a long life ahead. This is evident in the sheer scale of the program, such as the recent upgrade of the Strato Fortress to the B-52J version with new Rolls-Royce F-130 engines. However, this doesn't mean that either of these giants is better or worse. They both do what the times and current U.S. strategy require. The B-1B is all about speed and volume, climbing quickly, flying far, and unleashing tons of precision guided munitions on a target, leaving before the window of opportunity closes. Its upgrades aren't an attempt to become a miracle aircraft, but rather a pragmatic tweaking of a working tool. The B-52 is like an old ship with new engines and updated electronics. It's not chasing youth, it's building on its service life, and its strength lies in the platform's stability and the fact that any missile sensor or new communication system can be tweaked as if they were installed from the start. And here we come to the main idea. These two long-lived U.S. Air Force aircraft live long not because it's a pity to write them off, but because each of them remains useful in its own way. One goes with today's war and today's pace. The second one's getting ready to run tomorrow. And somewhere in the middle, the B-21 is growing into the next chapter in the history of U.S. strategic bombers, to which one of the distinguished veterans is about to pass the baton. 
Do you think the remaining 45 B1 fighters will be retired by 2035? Or will we still see their menacing silhouette in the sky alongside the B-52s even in the 2040s? Let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell for more content like today's. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.